This is the Science of GMOs. I'm Jessica Eyes, and today uh, we're joined by Dr. Ken Foster, a professor of agricultural economics at Purdue University. And uh, Ken, just to launch into this, uh, we're, we're looking at GMOs and labeling, and so if you can help me here, what is the current state of GMO labeling? Yeah, well, uh, up until this summer, 2016, there were no regulations for GMO labeling. There were private voluntary labels, like if somebody was producing a GMO-free or a non-GMO product, they were labeling that uh, to make sure that they could get the extra value out of the product. Uh, but there were no regulations by government, either at the federal or state level, that were in effect until 2016. Uh, and during the summer of 2016, uh, one state was getting ready to launch a set of regulations and in, in the meantime there was a bill going through Congress in Washington and that bill passed and since then President Obama has signed it. So we have a bill. Uh, people probably shouldn't expect though to see any labels, any mandatory labels showing up in the grocery stores right away. Okay, and so when it comes to GMOs and labeling, because GMOs have been around for some time, uh, why weren't there requirements that GMOs be labeled or, G or foods containing GMO uh, ingredients to be labeled prior to now? They concluded that GMO food ingredients weren't materially different from their conventional varieties. So if you think about corn, let's just use corn as an example. Uh, corn as an ingredient in the list of ingredients was corn, not GMO corn or non-GMO corn because FDA uh, concluded that those weren't materially different from each other. Mm -hmm. Uh, so these new rules um, that were uh, recently passed, um, what exactly do they require? What do they entail? What does it mean? Yeah, I'm not sure you're going to like this answer, <laughs> but uh, uh, we don't really know yet with great clarity because uh, the USDA has been charged with making the interpretations of the bill in terms of actual enforcement. So it's going to be up to USDA to decide uh, what exactly is a GMO ingredient. And that sounds pretty simple on the surface, but when you start to, you know, sort of drill down into it, um, then, you know, you get into uh, some, some questions that they're going to have to determine. So uh, let's take uh, soda pop, for example, that's, that's sweetened with high fructose corn syrup. There's no DNA in that, in that fructose corn syrup. It's just fructose. And so uh, from a testing point of view, uh, is, that a, is that a modified food product or not? Uh, so they'll have to make that. Because, it's it's because fructose is derived from corn? It's, well, this particular okay. type of high fructose syrup mm -hmm. is derived from corn that's okay. used to sweeten soda pop, uh, but it doesn't have any corn DNA nor any foreign DNA that we use to modify the corn. That's all you know, been sort of extracted through the further processing. Mm -hmm. It's just fructose syrup. Now you get into questions of, you know, natural occurring DNA that's been used for genetically engineering purposes versus uh, laboratory created DNA. Um, will, will those be treated differently? And the reason I bring that up is because there's a line in the bill that says uh, that, you know, the bill applies to food products that could not have occurred through conventional breeding or natural mutations. So who decides whether or not you know, this particular trait in a food product could have been developed right. through natural breeding or could have occurred mm -hmm. through some sort, or through conventional breeding or could have occurred as a natural mutation. So, so those are the things I think USDA is going to have to struggle with. I think it's pretty clear uh, that they're probably going to side toward things that have been modified in some way are going to be labeled, but we don't know that for sure yet. Um, may, maybe more directly to, I think, what you were asking is what's going to appear on the label mm -hmm. of the food product when I show up at the grocery store eventually once USDA figures those things out. And um, this is where there's been a little consternation in the news. So most proponents for mandatory labeling, I think, envisioned that there was going to be something very visible on the label that says GMOs in this product right, or no GMOs in this product. And that's not really the way the bill has been written. So the food processors will be given a fair amount of latitude. They can do that. And I suspect that anything that does not contain GMOs is going to have a very prominent GMO-free or non-GMO label on it. So Ken, my last question for you is, uh, why did agribusinesses get behind um, having a new federal requirement? Because from my understanding, for years they had been opposed to this. 
Yeah, so I think it's probably useful to think about why were they, uh, you know, resistant to a labeling law in the first place. And mostly that has to do with the cost of the labeling and the potential disruptions of a fairly finely tuned supply chain. Um, agriculture always uh, faces a lot of uncertainty with weather and things like that, but then you add another uncertainty in terms of a regulation and what its effects might be. Um, and the additional costs just, I think, were something they resisted for a potentially uncertain long-term benefit. Uh, but over the last six or so months, they saw emerging a lot of state initiatives for labeling of GMO products. And uh, as those were emerging, different states were developing different regulations with respect to labeling and the, the idea that you might have to have a separate label for each of those states. Uh, and the additional cost of that, I think, drove them to the idea that one label for the whole country that would satisfy all of these would be the least costly approach. Great, thank you so much, Ken, for joining us to talk about GMOs and labeling. I really appreciate you delving into the details with us. My pleasure. All right.